Good morning. Good morning. All right, like I said, so this is, right, like typically Alex will preach an hour on a, sometimes a word. Um, <laughs> right, so um, I'll give you a moment to clear your afternoon calendar and then we'll, we'll dump, jump in there. Um, no, but this was, uh, this was a, a thought that has, not even a thought, this, this is something that's come up to me over and over again, especially over the last year. Uh, in, in zeal ministry, uh, just conversations I've had with um, Christians, brothers and sisters, um, through interactions in church, through small groups, different things. Um, and there's just this sense of uh, burden that are on Christians, um, right? That they're, you know, they're not doing enough. They're not, uh, you know, performing or they're not good enough or I've, I've messed this up so bad that I, I, you know, surely I can't now do this, right? Um, and then I constantly came back in, in my study time, in my prayer time, and even in conversations to, to this parable as I just study these things. And um, I guess it was a couple months ago, we were, we were having a meeting and we were talking about our, our schedule for this. And... Uh, for, for Advent and, you know, wrapping up Acts Advent and then the, the next series. And we had this day here uh, that we didn't really know what we were going to do with. And um, I was like, well, I was like, I think let's just address this. Let's just take some time and just really kind of dive into God's character and his action and his heart toward us as Christians. Uh, and, and I really wanted to, to kind of look at this, you know, it's three parables. Typically, a lot of times we'll hear, you know, one of these preached at a time. Uh, but I want to go through and, you know, we're not going to go lot, verse by verse for sure. Um, you know, but I'm just, uh, it's my prayer that looking at these three parables from our king uh, as he speaks about, you know, God uh, and, and his heart for, for us as his, his children. Um, so let me pray, <clears throat> and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump into the text. <sighs> Father God, you're so good to us. Um, and it's so easy to get caught up in the, in the, in the day-to-day and the, and the busyness and the default of the flesh that, that um, we just forget to rest in you, God, that you desire that we know you, what you've done for us, God. And I just pray that this morning as we look at this parable, at these three parables, uh, these stories about your goodness toward us um, and how much joy you have in your children, uh, that we would fall in love with you, that we wouldn't even take the next step without really resting in this and these truths, God. Just thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. <clears throat> Amen. Okay, <clears throat> so... It's one of the things that kind of, you know, my mind works in, in certain ways. And so it's like, if I can start to like snap together like Legos, like pieces of, of, a, of logic <laughs> for me, right? Like if I can, oh, like I understand this piece and then like, just like Legos, right? You build on, I build on that. My mind logically kind of lays these things out. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, I always felt like there, there was this um, like identity crisis that we have in, in and of ourselves. Like we don't know who we are at times. Like we're like for me, I'll speak it. Like I'm constantly, um, you know, when I when I have a lot of caffeine, I'm very confident. I'm very this. I'm I'm, I'm really focused. Uh, and then other times, I'm super scared. I don't know. And I'm fearful. Uh, and, and so it's like in, in and of myself, I have this crisis. Like, am I good enough? Am I am I this or that? Um, and I think all that stems from really, uh, you know, the flip side is this identity crisis that we have and who we think God is or who we understand God to be, right? And so that goes, if we look at the, even the, in the garden, right? The, in the beginning, you know, God created heaven and earth. He created Adam and Eve. He placed them there and he walked with them, right? So there was this whole dynamic of, of just a intimate walking with his people. Um, and in that, in that moment of sin, you know, that obviously that's fractured, right? And so from, from then on, and even, even the act of the sin was a question of, of who God is and who, what his character was towards them, right? So even as um, you know, Satan was tempting Eve, it was like, what did God really say? Okay, well now I'm questioning, what, what did God say? What, what did, was it true? Uh, it, it, and, you know, and then she even, you know, if you read those words, right, this, 
she even put like like the Pharisees did, put this fence around uh, truth, right? Like, oh, well, not only am I not supposed to eat, I'm not even supposed to touch it. Look, I can't even, oh, I got to stay completely away, right? So it's just this fearfulness and this uh, questioning of, of God's character and God's love for her uh, in that moment that caused this, this, um, this fracture, right? And then later on, there's so many different examples, right? We, we can look at... Um, you know, even after the Exodus, right? That here's, you know, I'm the Lord your God who led you out of Egypt. He led everyone out of Egypt, all the Israelites out of Egypt. Um, and then Moses goes to to meet with God and get the, you know, the Ten Commandments, right? The basically the to have God reveal His character to Moses so that He could then come down. And through, you know, they're just impatient, probably fearful. Like Moses has been gone. He's when's he coming back? Is God even going to meet with us? He led us out here. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and so they crafted this golden calf, right? Which wasn't a separate God, it was just the replacement God. This is the one that, you know, is, that we can craft and we can put in front of us, and this is the God that led us out of Egypt, right? And so they worshiped that as God, um, trying to put on to that, onto God um, a character that they could at least try to uh, <laughs> see in front of them and, and have some, some comfort. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of times we, we tend to do that in our understanding of, of God, and even even in our understanding of like the Trinity, right? Like even understanding like who, okay, you know, we have Jesus, like Jesus loves us, right? This I know, he's, he's very kind, he's very caring. Um, and, and, you know, we have the Holy Spirit who's, you know, Holy Spirit, he's the God of my feelings, he's the God of, you know, my, my emotions as, as, and kind of defines how I experience things. And at some level, you know, God the Father, uh, is still sort of, you know, the cranky Old Testament God who, um, you know, when we mess up, we're still worried that he's going to act out towards us, right? Um, but I would argue that, you know, until we truly, you know, understand that the character, which we'll look at here, um, you know, we, we won't be able to fix our identity crisis, right? Like, and, and that's, and I don't even want to, I don't even want to, talk about us today, right? Because, uh, and it was interesting too, as, as, it, as I was thinking through these things, it's like, this is the time of year where we, this is where we do think about, what am I going to change about myself? You know, what are all the things that I couldn't do or didn't do or wanted to do last year that on January 1st, all of a sudden, I'm good. Like, I'm going to be super fit. I'm going to eat really well. I'm going to read all these books. I'm going to whatever, right? Um, <clears throat> but instead, I, I think, if we could just take a moment and, and breathe and, and look at our God and, and just kind of soak that in. And before we even attempt to offer what, whatever we feel would be pleasing to him in our, in our worship, um, that we would just know him better. So that's my, that's my pastoral heart for us this morning. It's even a very small, small crew, but I'm glad you're here. Um, so let's just look at, at, a, at these parables. And I'm not going to read them again. I'm, I'm really going to kind of talk through them. Uh, so we have the first, first parable, right? The, the good shepherd. Uh, we have this, you know, 100 sheep. One of them wanders off. Um, you know, very relatable. We've really heard this you know, a lot, right? We know good shepherd, Jesus. We really, we really equate these, these two things. Um, pretty easily in our minds, right? Like, I wandered, I was lost, Jesus came, found me, and brought me home, right? Um, and even in, in, in the Old Testament, the, uh, the idea of shepherd um, before, you know, the incarnate Christ was talked about a lot, right? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, right? Um, Isaiah 40, 11, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. This is talking about Jesus, but, you know, it's God, Right? This is the fullness of God. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Ezekiel 34, 11, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. <clears throat> so even in, you know, right, so Jesus is laying out some things here for us to see. Um, he refers to himself in the Gospel of John frequently, right, as I am the good shepherd, I am the, the door to the sheep pen, I am, you know, all these things of, of that, you know, he is, 
he is the one that, that gathers the sheep. He was sent, right, to go out and gather the lost. Um, <clears throat> and then we have the next parable, which this was interesting for me, as again, like I, I kind of thinking, I was thinking I was washing dishes, Micah, when I, when I thought about it. <laughs> that's my holy, that's holy grounds. I have to take my shoes off and everything when I wash dishes because that's where he speaks to me um, the most, it seems, uh, which is probably why you give me so many opportunities. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I was thinking about this. So we have, you know, I'm a little off track, but so we have the, the, the good shepherd, right? We have the shepherd who leaves the, 90, leaves the 99 to go after the one, right? So one, he's lost one one hundredth of his, of his flock. And, you know, and it's not because that sheep is so great, right? That sheep's really stupid, right? Sheep are not smart animals. So he's, he's just wandered away uh, in his lostness. And he would stay there, right? So the shepherd values the, law, the one that's lost, right? And so his 99 are safe and secure in the pen. They're, they're safe. They're not going anywhere. The shepherd goes out uh, and seeks and brings back. And so then I, I thought about, you know, the prodigal, which we'll get into, but just as a kind of a little preview in a sense, right? Like that's the father. We kind of associate that as, you know, right? It's the father, two sons, the father. Um, so I thought, well, what is this? You know, we have this parable of the, of the woman and the lost coin. And I say, okay, well, you know, I think there's, there's something here, um, right? Like there, there's got to be something about the Trinity in this, you know, even in these parables, why they, they should go together, why Jesus chose to kind of map them out this way. And so I picked up my, I have a little commentary, and sure enough, actually I Googled it first, which referenced the commentary I had sitting, which, which I hadn't read yet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, oh, yes. Like, so it is the lamp, right? The lamp is the spirit. The lamp is, is the Holy Spirit that gives us illumination uh, that, um, you know, if you can kind of, kind of see that in that room. So she's lost this coin, so one out of 10, right? So now we're at one-tenth of her possessions. Uh, the, the sheep, one one-hundredth, the value that, that the shepherd puts on the, on, the, on the one and brings that back. We have uh, a tenth now, or one-tenth uh, of, of a possession that's lost. And so the, the woman with the lamp is just scurrying, you know, sweeping everything, moving things around, trying to find this, this one, this one uh, coin, right? And there's all, again, there's, so many things, and I, I know we've, we've heard these kind of preached before, and I don't want to get into the minutia of a, of a lot of the, like, you know, things that w when you can really focus in, right? But it's not the, the value. I think that there's been sermons where it talks about, oh, well, these coins were so valuable to the woman because, blah, blah, you know, whatever, right? But it, it, it was the value that God puts on the lost thing. That's where the value comes from. And so the spirit is, is illuminating the room. It's... it's um, moving furniture out of the way. It's sweeping aside all those things and bringing it into focus uh, that which is lost and then that which is found, right, um, by the Spirit. And so Jesus is saying, so now we have, um, you know, the Son, the, the, shepherd, the Good Shepherd that goes. We have the, the Holy Spirit that illuminates and, and brings uh, light to the darkness. And, um, and then we get to, to the last, right? And so this is probably one of the most popular uh, parables, right? The prodigal son or the lost son. It would really be lost, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. So 50%, right? One out of, one out of two is now lost in, in this scenario. And this is where I want to settle in uh, a little bit in depth this morning. Um, we do see in the first two, right? It, it, the, the absolute joy that the, the good shepherd has at finding his lost sheep brings back that one. It just celebrates. Everybody, you know, come, you know, help me celebrate, you know, be part of this. Same thing with the, with the lost coin, invites all our friends in, a big party. Um, you know, so just that heart that, oh man, like, this is so special to me, and I, and I want it with me. I need, you know, I need it with, it, with me. Um, but I think what we actually see, even in, in, so we have those two that are kind of separate, but even in this prodigal son, this lost son, we see all three, again, represented, in a way, right? So, um, let's, let's take a look. And so we have this son, and he goes to his father and um, essentially says, like, I wish you were dead. I, I no longer, I don't want to be part of this family. I just want what you have. I want what's rightfully mine, right? Even though it's not his, it's the father's. Uh, uh, I don't really care about you. I just want my stuff that, that I deem is mine, <clears throat> and I'm out. I'm heading out. So his father gives him his, uh, his inheritance, 
and he goes off and just and squanders it in, in you know, any number of you know prostitutes, um, drinking drugs, you know, whatever those whatever would be of the times that you know. But we would be able to see that right in our experience that we would just right like Romans says we would we would deny the creator and then worship the created and so we would we would want to lean into to all that this world has to offer and just say you know god uh, father i i have no use of you i just i just want your stuff and so he he does this until right like he's absolutely spent everything he has nothing his only uh, hope is to go and work. And, and so, it, and Jesus is always digging in, right, with these parables. He's always trying to get to, and so he's talking to Pharisees at this point. Like this is focused towards them, right? And in, in the very beginning of the chapter, it's, you know, talks about him, oh, he's dining with sinners and tax collectors and things like that. And so these Pharisees are just repulsed anyway by, by Jesus. Uh, and so, or at least how he would associate, right, with, with these people out in the world. And so Jesus even digs in even more. So not only did he just deny the Father, which would have been terrible, and go and, and, and um, you know, live it up in the most sinful possible ways, but even in, in the, the total loss of everything, would then go and, and tend to sheep, or uh, I'm sorry, to pigs, right, which were the, was a filthy animal for, for the Jews. And he would just desire to eat this pig mess, you know, the, that the pigs eat, um, making him completely unclean spiritually. And, and not just, uh, you know, being a jerk, <laughs> right? But just spiritually unclean and just uh, completely separate and, and unable to approach God in any, in any way in, at this state. And so it says, if I can find it, um, in verse 17, but when he came to himself, right? And this is not a, this guy automatically got smart and, and figured it out, but this is, the reference to the Holy Spirit at work, right? The Holy Spirit moving, moving chairs out of the way, giving light. Light came on. He came to himself and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so he comes to this awareness that you know, that God, or let's say father, right, his dad is, well, he's still not really acknowledging his complete goodness, but he acknowledges that, hey, at least the people that work for, for my dad have good stuff. Like, they have food to eat. They have a, a roof over their head. Um, so I'll just go back. You know, I'll suck it up a little bit. I've sinned against my father. I've sinned against uh, heaven. I'll go, and, and I'll just work as a servant. I'll work as a slave, and you know, just, just get by at that point. And he came and, arose, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And you can imagine, like I kind of imagine this, you know, because I do it all the time in, in other ways, right? Like this, this rehearsal of, you know, when I go, if I need to apologize to my wife or, or something, or I need to explain something at work, like this, whatever it is, even before God, right? Okay, let me rehearse this. How's this going to play out? Like this is this is what I'm going to offer to you as uh, condolences, and and you know maybe like we can work this out. So here's my this, and then you know okay, and he'll say that, and uh, and it's like this back and forth that I'm dialogue that I have in my head as I'm kind of you know, approaching this. And I can just imagine that the son is, you know, because this is journey, he's not jumping in his car and kind of going, you know, going out. So he's, he's walking. Who knows how long he's just walking and rehearsing this, this whole dialogue in his head. And, okay, all right, that is sin. I really screwed up. Um, just, if you can just give me a job, you know, that'll be good. And, you know, oh, okay. And so it says... He rose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Right, and so, again, I'm not going to say I'm not saying things that you know church folk haven't heard, right? But you know, this is highly irregular for a, a man of esteem, right, the father, to to run after this son to run period right so that's not what he does he sends somebody else to run right um 
and he would have cloaks, long cloaks and, and all like that and just be all decked out. He would have to pull up his, his whole everything, like his garments, just to even get his knees <laughs> running towards his, towards his son who was coming home, right? His son. But that's not even the most scandalous piece that, I, that I'm seeing here, right? Like this is, a, this is, to me is, right? Like this is scandalous to the culture, but the, how much more scandalous is it that Christ, God, Right, like I think Alex mentioned it last week. Right, that did not consider himself equal, but came down as one of us. Right, and just shed off all that glory, and just became flesh and blood. And he was, you know, he lived this this dirty life in this place. Right, and and was beaten. Right, like that's the scandalous gospel that he was beaten. Those whip, those whips on him, those marks, the spit that was on him, the crown of thorns, all that stuff that was, that was ours. Right, and that the God of heaven, you know, that's the scandalous piece. So the fact that the father would just kind of forget about his, in the parable, would forget about his, you know, kind of his position and the way he looked and the way he, he was perceived by any, you know, anybody that was working for him, right? His work, big business, all these people are seeing this. It's just representative of the fact that, that God did not even consider anything but giving it all, right, to, and not a caring about appearances and really getting down and getting in it and running toward us in our lostness to find us. <clears throat> and so the son began to give his prepared speech. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. So the son had a, a, an expectation of his position upon his, his confession to the father. Um, but the father would not, even, would not even hear it, right? And you can kind of imagine, too, like, you can't even get it all out. Like, oh, yeah. no, no. And, he, and essentially, you know, that, that putting on of the robe, right, that's the family. It's, you're, you're fully, you're part of the family again. This is your royal robe. This ring, the ring represents, you know, identity in, in this family. And, and in a lot of ways, and I think back, I think it's uh, Esther, right? Like, the, the ring uh, that was given to Mordecai was used to, to kind of stamp an envelope Right, so it had authority with it, right? So when you wrote up a law, when you wrote a rule and you had that, the signet ring, you could fold it up and you put the wax and you put the, the, the imprint on that. And that said, okay, this is, this is a message that is that given authority from the king to this person to communicate this, um, this information or this you know, commandment or rule or what, whatever the case may be, right? And so this... This whole idea and shoes on the feet, everything is just this full restoration, right? He is not being, uh, he is not like sort of like the junior partner, uh, you know. He's not subservient to to the workers. He's not anything other than my son to the father. Full restoration. And the father goes on to say in verse 24, for my, this is my son. He was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Verse 25. <clears throat> now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back and sound, safe and sound. But the son, the older son, was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes and killed the fat, you killed the fattened calf for him. And I think, you know, as I mentioned, right, so we, I would be remiss if I didn't 
really hone in and, and say, like, this is directed towards the Pharisees directly, right? So the older son in this, in this parable is the Pharisees, are the sad. They are the ones that, um, right, they have misunderstood the character of God. They have misunderstood their calling of God's chosen people, right? So because they misunderstood who God is and what he desired for humanity as a whole, they misunderstood their position as authorities, right? And they've created, they've heaped burden, they've created more rules and more rules for the people to follow to the point where it was just impossible. And they certainly would not um, celebrate uh, a non-Jew, right? Or, uh, you know, in this case, just tax collectors, sinners, all, all, the, all these people that they, they deemed uh, unclean, they certainly would not celebrate that. But I wonder, you know, how we, you know, I think there's older brother in, in a lot of us, in a sense, right? Like, I think we're quick to identify as the lost son, right? That's, that's I don't want to say it's easy, right? But most of us have kind of been there, right? Uh, I know I have. I was a late, uh, late arrival <laughs> in, my, in my early 30s. Um, and so I certainly relate to that. But I think there's plenty of, older brother to relate to as well. You know, maybe, um, you know, maybe we have thoughts at times like, you know, I'm doing all the right things. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'm not a legalist, right? But I'm, I'm doing this stuff. I, I'm kind of, I'm committed. I'm in ministry. I help other people. So why is, you know, Johnny do nothing always seem to get ahead, right? Or, you know, I've been a, a Christian all my life. Um, you know, I don't have a good, I don't have a powerful testimony. You know, I mean, how is God going to use that? Uh, you know, it's just kind of like, I've always done kind of the right thing, but yet, you know, these folks that kind of come in and they have this, this wild and amazing transformation, they're, you know, they, they get this kind of uh, spotlight all the time. And so even though it's not this, God, I can't believe you saved them. Why would you bother to save them? It's just sort of this hardness in a sense that, you know, I'm not really getting what I deserve. Uh, you know, maybe we don't really like ascend to that. Like maybe that, that sounds a little strong, but I think at some level, there, uh, not all of it, but I think there's times at least where we have some older brother in us where we kind of kind of feel that that weight of, well, you know, I've been, I've been the good guy, been the good girl. Um, you know, when am I going to kind of get mine? And the father answers, answers to that. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. And I think we always have to remember that. Like even, even in the lost son coming back, you know, the father didn't hesitate to offer, you know, hey, you, you want your inheritance. But even after squandering half and coming back, all that the father had was still his. All that the father had was given to the, to the lost son. And for the older son, all that he has has always been his. And it's just not understanding the goodness and the character of God that as his children, right? We, that was what Ephesians was all about. Especially, you know, the first half especially, right? If you were here for that series. The whole thing was about God and his goodness before the foundations of the earth had a plan to rescue lost, lost sinners, right? Rescue humanity by sending his son and by the power of the spirit, you know, saving us and sealing us. That we would be children of God, right? We, we even, a week or two ago, even in our Advent series, right? That, that through him, through Christ, that we would all have the right of children, right? The inheritance. That, so everything that is in Christ is, then, is, is now ours. And I think that's where we kind of run into, run into these issues, that we, just, that we don't understand the, the complete goodness of God in, these, in his heart towards us. That not only does he desire us, not only does, is everything that he has given his son and has been bought by his son for us is ours, but that he desires, he wants to lavishly pour that out. Again, Ephesians, right? He wants to pour out the grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy. All these things are ours 
because of what he's done for us. And I just want us to, <clears throat> you know, take that time to, to really understand that. Um, because I think we are just so quick to look past that or to, to get to the works or get to the, to the resolution or get to the, you know, what can I offer back before we understand God's heart toward us in, in receiving that? And this is not a, right, prosperity message. I mean, the, God's message is prosperity, right, for, for all eternity for, for his children. Um, but it's not, you know, in a sense that, like, let's, let's make sure we get this so we can get that. No, it's just, we, you know, Jesus, his burden is light. That's not a joke, <laughs> you know. He is not saying, and, and we don't feel it, right? We don't feel it in this, in this world a lot of times. But we heap burden on ourselves by misunderstanding that not only does he want to save us, not only does he want to, like, just kind of put us to work, but he wants to restore us completely in himself. He wants to um, celebrate, right? Like, if you can picture that, even in, even in that uh, in in the Trinity, right? Like that's the celebration that's happening, and we just watched, you know, the what it was Cosmic Christmas or something. Uh, what is it now? I can't. Remember. Angel story. Uh, it was an old story, but you know, it's it's a drama, but it talks us, you know, about the the angel, what the angels kind of perceive, right? And it's you know, in, in scripture and in different. Um, I'm going to say First Peter. I could be wrong. Um, but just this idea that even the angels, they, like they don't even understand it completely, but they just Oh, praise God. They just can't believe why, why God would take, take this effort, why he would do these things and, and shed his blood and, and just desire these little creatures, right? Like, like ants. We would look at ants like, why does he desire that? And then, but you can just imagine like all these things when the, when the one, one out of 100 sheep comes home and the one out of 10 coin is found and then the, the lost brother is, was dead and is now alive with that celebration within himself right within the within the godhead himself just that celebration um that everything is brought to light now even i kind of thought of like the father in that moment right like as he's waiting for the son even before he sees the son far off right like that he's outside and he's not like kind of like i just i hope this works right like he doesn't have anxiety about this right because he knows he knows his plan i made the plan i'm the god of the universe i know i i I sent the son. I know he's going to secure that. There's no doubt about that. And now my spirit's out there working and, 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 and bringing to light my goodness and, and he's calling my people, right? Calling my sheep back home. I know it's done. And so it was just when he saw the son, it was, it was not even like a, a relief. It was just like, yes, let's celebrate. Let's get this in here. Let's get this going, All right? And we got to really, kinda, a really, my prayer for you this morning is that we would see, that you would see that and that we would really just kind of for the new year, for lack of a better way, what is time anymore? I don't even know. <laughs> Every day is, is Monday because uh, I work from home and stuff. But, um, but right, that, that we could lean into that. And <clears throat> what I want to do this morning too, so typically we have a prayer time um, where everybody can pray. But this is just a thought that I had and uh, it's a small group, but I'm still going to do it anyway. I've asked the, the core team, some of the core team, um, to pray over you guys this morning, right? Like, I just want you to um, not sit here and think about, oh, should I say something or should I not say something or should I, you know, oh, is this or that, or just have any tension. I just want you to receive prayer from our core team um, that we would just see God's heart and his character toward us, toward you, um, and that, that would really just transform your understanding of, of, of everything, that, that you would kind of be able to start, and it, you know, I don't know some of you uh, at all, so maybe you're further along, and maybe I was just kind of like doing some, some church 101 here, but I think we always need to re be reminded for sure uh, of these things, but maybe it's just, sometimes it's the simple thing, sometimes it's the simple message that helps us stack some blocks and really start to see the threads and, and, and the kind of the whole and the, oh my gosh, like I would never even thought about how, how, you know, God relates to me in this and to that and it all comes together and then we just, you know, praise God for, for what he's revealed to us. Because in all honesty, the, the fact is, is that God 
did come, the, the re he came, he wants to be known by us, right? He has revealed himself uh, throughout eternity, throughout our eternity, so that he can be known. It's not a riddle. He's not trying to, you know, create a, a sect of super Christians that, that know more than, than anybody else. His, his desire that we would know him and we would do that fully and more fully. And that, that's our eternity as Christians, folks, too, that we would know him for all eternity. It's going to be more and more and more, right? We don't even know what that, I have no idea what that means. But, you know, I'm ready. So that's what we'll do. Um, I appreciate it, you know, um, this morning, but I, I, I really want, um, I can't remember what order I think I, I said we were going to do these in, but Mike is going to begin praying for you all. Um, and then I think Micah, Julie, Maddie, Matt, and then I'll, I'll close out our time. And then we'll sing some, some worship music. All right. Thanks, everybody.